Hey Lower Six, I hope you're all keeping safe and well and that delving into your A2 literary text is providing a distraction from all that's going on. I'm sure you've been doing lots of reading. Um, today we're going to be looking at Michael Frayn's Spies and what I'm going to do is offer you a working close reading of the first three chapters that you can then use as pointers for your own more detailed annotations. If we turn to the first page of the novel, Frame's working very hard here to establish um, the complex narrative voice of Stephen Weeping. And he writes, For a moment I'm a child again, and everything's before me, all the frightening, half-understood promise of life. This narrative voice is complex because we have the older Stephen Wheatley looking back at his memories and reflecting on his younger self whilst at points in the narrative inhabiting the identity of his younger self um, and offering us uh, the voice of the childhood Stephen Wheatley through interior monologue. And I think Michael Frayn's certainly playing with elements of fictional autobiography uh, throughout the novel. Um, remember, bio is like graphy, writing, auto-self. It's literally the writing of the self. What does it mean to narrate a lived experience? How does it alter that experience and alter one's identity? What is it to write the self? Um, and if you want some critical opinion on that, you might want to look at um, figures such as Hermione Lee, who've explored how writers um, have used biography and autobiography uh, throughout the centuries. In the second paragraph, Frayn evokes a very pungent scent, and it's this which triggers Stephen's memories. Um, and he describes, it reeks, it has a kind of sexual urgency to it, and it unsettles me, as it always does. I feel what? Quite often in novels, writers will use images, um, and in poetry it's an oral tradition, so they often will play with sounds. But here it's interesting that Frayn chooses scent as the trigger for Stephen's memories. And all these questions that run throughout the first uh, chapter, these rhetorical questions, I feel what? It's to engage the reader in the active work of memory. They, like Stephen, are trying to figure out what that smell could be. And that technique is used throughout the novel to involve them in the kind of detective plot of the story, giving them clues, asking them questions, getting them to piece the pieces of the puzzle together. As this paragraph continues, uh, the voice of Stephen Wheatley describes how, I have a feeling that something somewhere has been left unresolved that some secret thing in the air around me is still waiting to be discovered. And of course we have this anticipation, this foreboding of what will be revealed throughout the novel. Stephen describes how the place I should like to be off to is my childhood. And Frame figures this journey into the past as a temple journey, a journey of going back into one's memory. Um, and he pictures it as a spatial experience. Um, the past is a place, and if you wanted some um, a theory on that, you might want to think about Freud and how he conceptualises memory as a house with lots of rooms and doors to be opened. These couple of pages continue. Stephen describes how he's going to enter the deepest recesses of my memory. So he's really building up this idea of the memory being an unconscious one's got to delve into. Um, and what it will reveal about the self and the identity of the self. And these memories are duplicitous. Stephen describes at the bottom, towards the bottom of page five, what he half remembers. The act of remembering alters the lived experience. On page six, Stephen describes how he wants to establish some order in it all, some sense of their connectedness. And it's this reordering, this rewriting of memories um, that's really occupying Frame throughout these opening chapters. As we begin uh, chapter two, he describes Stephen's uh, setting off on his journey to his childhood home, the close, uh, the suburbs of London. And he describes how everything is as it was, I discover when I reach my destination. 
and everything has changed. It's this paradox, this ambivalence between the past and the present still occupying the same space for Stephen. We have the beautiful description of the sky and he says, once the war was written across it in a tangled scribble of heroic vapour trails. And it conjures up um, a nostalgic atmosphere for the 1940s and the Second World War. And that nostalgia is emphasised through some cinematic techniques that Frames employs. Um, he describes how, on page 11, this familiar sequence of sounds unrolls. The whole appearance of the close shifts in front of my eyes. It's this idea of he's entering the past and it's like a transition cut's been used and one image is fading in and another's um, fading out and another's coming in. Um, he builds and upon he, this when he talks about on page 12 looking at images of himself as black and white snaps monochrome and they have then of course become colour when we're introduced to Keith and the colours on his belt. So it's almost like a black and white film transforming into Technicolor. So quite a few cinematic techniques here that bring the past to life. And he asks, this is what I see as I look at it now, but is that the way that he sees it at his age? So he's using um, this commentary on his younger self and then soon he'll come to just bring young Stephen's voice to the fore and that will occupy uh, the novel, but at this stage we've got this to jump between him reflecting on his younger self. He describes how on the end of page 12, I watch him now. He's observing himself, but we have to remember it's from the temporal distance of years. So he's observing himself in the past and observing himself as a child. And he'll explore what that means as the novel continues. He builds upon this idea of the past being like a, a dream. He describes how um, young Stephen is lost in some kind of vague daydream. He asks, what do I feel about him as I watch him now? He's really working in these two pages, pages 12 and 13, to bring the young Stephen Wheatley to life as a character. And it's, um, it's this idea of it being quite nostalgic in tone. There's the occasional bicycle, the slow plodding horses, the milkman. Um, so there's a fondness that we feel the protagonist Stephen has for his, his childhood. He then sort of breaks this chapter um, by describing, he, he talks us through the different families in the place and he gives us a sense of uh, suburban snobbery during the, the 40s. And he describes the Haywards and he says, this is where the story began, at the Haywards. On the day when Keith, my best friend, first pronounced those six simple words that turned our world inside out. He's really using these um, hints to create suspense and foreboding to keep us uh, engaged in the riddle of what's going to be revealed about his past. Um, and we have described everything that's feeding these young boys' imaginations. On the top of page 18, in that first paragraph, we have um, the, power, the battery powered gadgets, the torches. Uh, we have, there's a shelf of boys' stories in which desert islands are colonised, missions flown in biplanes, and secret passageways discovered. Stephen's very literary, and we're very aware that as he narrates his own life, he is drawing. Uh, on a literary tradition, much in the same way the young Stephen draws upon uh, this literary tradition to feed his imagination when he goes on his spying adventures with Keith. He then again builds up these characters in a small suburban community. Um, he describes Keith's mother and father um, and the other the pinchers and the other characters um, with great vividness very evocative of the time period, playing on a lot of gender stereotypes, a lot of small town stereotypes, which would have been very true to a small suburban community. He often employs throughout this novel contrasts to enable us to picture characters in more depth. So we have Auntie D contrasted to Keith's mother to enable us to get a greater sense of their characters. We introduced Uncle Peter, the bomber pilot. You may wish to explore some context of bomber pilots um, during the war. Here uh, we have 
a sense of great pride that everyone feels towards Uncle Peter that of course will run throughout the novel. Um, but following the war, the bomber pilots, their efforts weren't recognised. It was only much later, uh, during our time, that we finally recognised the sacrifice made by bomber pilots, because obviously the atrocities they carried out uh, upon German civilians uh, was was harrowing and, and a, considered an embarrassment, even though it, like so many things in the war, was necessary. Um, he describes Uncle Peter's absence. His very absence was a kind of presence, and this again is a foreboding. As this chapter continues, what Frame's offering us is a childhood perspective on the world um, and all the, all the figures in that community, but we have to remember it's filtered through the adult eyes and the adult voice at this stage of, of Stephen, uh, the older Stephen. On the top of page 26, he asks, didn't Stephen love his own family then? Didn't he appreciate at the time the qualities that he discovered in them later, or that affected him more and more deeply as he got older? Here he's ruminating on the relationship one has with the past and perspectives and how they shift and change. And this, this is a central preoccupation of Frames and it takes its form throughout the novel. We have again hints of things to come with the use of the dialects of Kudelmoodle and Schnickschnack when he's describing words that his own father uses. And there again a little clue about things that might occur later in the novel. On page 28 um, we plunge into a description of Keith's family life in Keith's house. And he, there's great relish for this past, uh, as Stephen says. But where he longed to be was at Keith's house. And what he loved most at Keith's house was being invited to tea. The third person voice, he's really trying to inhabit um, the younger Keith by at first observing him and trying to empathise. Those teas, at once I taste the chocolate spread on a thick plank of bread. So we quickly switch now to the present tense. And this playing with tenses and with first and third person is the way that Frey's negotiating the relationship between the complex narrative voice of the older Stephen and a younger Stephen. We have introduced the motif of the lemon barley covered by a lace weighted with four blue beads and it's repeated throughout the novel and it captures childhood naivety and innocence and sweetness um, and also protection. On page 30 we again have the motif of the privet um, and Brain describes how it half suffocated Stephen with the core sweetness that would pursue him down the years. That's how it's symbolic of repression and concealment and that will obviously become key uh, as the plot of the novel comes to the fore. And then the confusion of the older Stephen trying to piece together these memories. He describes how something that doesn't quite fit here as so often when one tries to assemble different bits to make a whole. And it's this idea of reconstructing, him piecing together his memories, him rewriting. And it's the crafting of a story. This, is, this text is a comment on how writers craft stories. It's a very self-conscious writing exercise. On page 32, Stephen describes how, What I remember when I examine my memory carefully isn't a narrative at all. It's a collection of vivid particulars. Certain words spoken, certain objects glimpsed, certain gestures and expressions, certain moods, certain weathers, certain times of day and states of light, certain individual moments, which seem to mean so much, but which mean in fact so little, until the hidden links between them have been found. And that's what Stephen's task is, it's to piece this together, and it's the task of constructing a story. And then the confusion that Stephen experiences on page 32 of trying to piece this together is mirrored in the confusion of the reader and that's to really engage us and involve us in this plot of piecing together the detective story. And we have the crux of this relationship between the older Stephen reflecting on his life in this sentence on page 33. Or is memory being overwritten by hindsight once more? And it's that act of changing memories in the process of reflecting. And then of course we have the six key words. My mother is a German spy. 
And that end of the chapter is what propels the narrative into its detective mission. So as we turn uh, to chapter three, we have Keith and Stephen excited by their childhood um, game of finding out whether Keith's mother is really a spy. And Frayne evokes this sense of a childhood imagination and the worlds that ch children operate. They set about spying on Keith's mother. And this idea of being secret, misspelled on page 40, captures the childhood naivety and innocence in their playing. Um, as she even pretends to play along on page 41, Frayne describes she's pretending to be part of some innocent children's game. And they're playing at being detectives. And Stephen's enjoying um, having this grand secret. Young Stephen is aware at this point of the difference between a childhood game and an adult reality. And that becomes clear on page 45 when he looks up at the photos above Keith's mother's writing desk. And he says, it's Keith's mother I realise uneasily. And she's playing at being the grown-up she has since become. And it's this disjunct between when children play and they don't really know the difference between their own playing and the adult world. And then when they come to realise that difference. And Stephen is realising the difference between playing at finding out whether Keith's mother's a spy and the darker reality of snooping through her diary. Um, and on page 47... Frayne describes how mother and father, aunt and uncle, all four of them watch us out of the past as we work to penetrate the secrets of the present and dismantle their future. And that's a comment on what the older version of Stephen will do throughout the novel. He's trying to penetrate secrets and, and dismantle uh, the past in doing so. And it has an impact on the present, it has an impact on the future. So those temporal um, states are starting to kind of become into conflict and Stephen realises that they're in territory they shouldn't really be occupying and it's not it's starting to be outside of a game when he describes we've stumbled across something that's actually secret he's aware uh, that their game is taking on a much darker more serious vein then the boys both swear to secrecy and at the end of the chapter Keith writes privet, private, spelt incorrectly. And the misspelling is obviously humorous um, and it captures that childhood innocence and naivety. But the symbol of the privet is much darker in evoking adult reserve, secrecy, repression. And it's that play between childhood innocence and a much darker adult existence, which is captured in, in that privet, uh, the misspelling, that's central throughout the novel. I hope that working post analysis of the first three chapters um, has been useful in helping you to annotate. And I hope you're enjoying the novel um, and wondering what's going to happen to Keith and Stephen. Mother, is she really a spy?